Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our CSEC lecture series. And thank you for tuning in to another episode. This um, lecture series is a collaborative effort between the University of the West Indies History and Archaeological Department and the Institute of Jamaica. Um, and my name is Alexis McDavid, and I am the Outreach Officer at National Museum Jamaica, which is a division of the Institute of Jamaica. And here with me today, I have Professor James Robertson. And just to give you a short introduction for Professor Robertson, his full bio will be um, linked in the description box on our social media platforms. Um, Professor Robertson is a past president of both the Archaeological Society of Jamaica and the Jamaican Historical Society. He's the author of countless books, and he has written <laughs> on <laughs> English and Jamaican history, including archives, the Chinese in Jamaica, Creole architecture, early settlement patterns, and so on. And right now, he is a member of the board of, on, well, sorry, he's a member um, on the board of the Jamaica National Heritage Trust and the National Museum Jamaica, my division, as well as the National Archives Committee. And he'll be, he will be discussing theme two on the CSEC syllabus, which is Caribbean economy and slavery. And the topic is marginal crops, mahogany, logwood, cotton, coffee, and cocoa production. Thank you so much, Prof. Robertson, for um, joining us today for our lecture series. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so to kick things off, um, I wanted to ask you, what does it mean to be a secondary crop in the Sugar Islands? And why did minor crops matter? Well, for a secondary crop, is I think you need to recognize that in marketing stuff like uh, mahogany uh, or co coffee, that they're being sold within the trading system that's set up for sugar. Um, by the late 17th century and through up to the 1840s, uh, sugar is privileged, it has tariffs to, if it's sold in England or in Britain. As a result, sugar gets a better crop if the cargo is unloaded in London or Bristol or wherever because of the tax sales. The difficulty is if you bring your coffee or your ginger or your other secondary crops, they might actually have got a better deal if you'd been able to take them directly to Hamburg uh, or somewhere else in continental Europe. But because you've got to drop them off in London first or in England first, uh, the merchants there may well offer a lower price and the taxes will be higher because the tax system for the West Indies is set up for sugar. And every other crop uh, from the West Indies is having to go through a template that works for sugar, but isn't necessarily go so good for selling something like coffee. So how were they identified? And can we put a sense of time on these crops? Well, in part, I think we've got the desire to sell things. When the settlements begin to happen in the West Indies, it's the search for crops and search for exports that makes people do the transatlantic voyages. The Dutch, who had traded with the Spaniards a lot earlier, when they start having their civil war and rebellion against the Spaniards in the uh, 1560s, they start going to the West Indies because they used to buy their salt from Spain and now they're fighting Spain. They go to places like um, uh, the, the Dutch islands because they are small and dry and miserable, but they're also really good for doing salt. The English and to a degree the French are both there because they're trying to get export crops. To a degree, they start by looking at export crops that are already selling in Europe, like sugar. Uh, and then they start trying to experiment with other crops. So if you look at early Barbados, there's attempts to grow uh, rhubarb, there's attempts to grow uh, ginger, and the rest. And if you look at, at Jamaica, you can see that Jamaica's agricultural history is punctuated with attempts to find a new crop or a new crop or a new crop. 
Jamaica is different from the other British islands that uh, it was stolen, uh, I'm sorry, captured, captured uh, from the Spaniards. And therefore, it's the only island that uh, a Protestant nation has their hands on that has some of the commercial export crops from Latin, uh, uh, mainland Latin America or Central America. Uh, there's an attempt to go cocoa, and for the first 1660 to 1670, cocoa is the crop that seems most promising for exports from Jamaica. And then there's a blight, and it collapses, and sugar takes over. But you also get attempts to grow other tropical crops like uh, indigo, which is undercut because it can be produced more cheaply in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, but Right the way through Jamaican history and the other islands' history, you can see attempts to bring in alternative crops. Uh, cotton is one of them. And at intervals, there's attempts to bring in cotton, either as a substitute uh, or for secondary lands. So number one, what we've got with secondary crops is right across the sugar triumph in the West British West Indies, which is plus or minus um, 1650, maybe the late 1640s for Barbados, up to uh, the abolition of the preferential duties in the uh, 1840s. And even then, you've still got sugar as the major crop, but again, attempts to do secondaries as well. So at one level, the secondary crops are what sugar initially was. Sugar starts off as an effort with a new crop, and then it takes off and does well, and has ruined teeth in England for um, 300 years. But you've got other efforts to have crops as well. Uh, and I think what you get with the other crops, and this shows up in Jamaica, but you can see it in other islands too, is the efforts to find alternative uses for land and land that can't be used for sugar. So that's where you see coffee being developed uh, or attempted from the 1720s and then really taking off in the 1790s when the great French sugar uh, or French coffee plantations in Saint-Domingue uh, are in the middle of a revolt. And therefore, even Jamaican coffee can get a market. So there had been Jamaican coffee and it had had a market beforehand, but it hadn't had the premium market that the French coffees had had uh, before the revolution. So that's two answers of why secondary. I think one is that the, the primary tends to be sugar. But if you look at Granada um, um, in, in, in the, the, the mid 18th century, there it moves pretty fast to nutmeg which is far more profitable because you can't get it otherwise outside the Indian Ocean. So there are, there are places which, uh, and, and for, again, for mahogany, which is unlike the other crops because it is indigenous, it's grown within the region, uh, it's the growth area for mahogany is most of the Caribbean. You can get some of it in Florida, Southern Florida. Um, and it's initially developed by the Spaniards for, for naval goods in the um, 17th century. But uh, mahogany takes off in the 18th century. But there it's logging out an indigenous timber. Uh, and then you get the ex extension of mahogany over to B uh, British Honduras, now Belize, uh, where it continues to be a key part of the economy well into the 19th and early 20th centuries. So there, you've got the degree of secondary crops. So again, coffee, uh, mahogany fits in the margins of the economies for the sugar islands. Uh, in part, when you're clearing, when land is being cleared, uh, mahogany, uh, logwood, the other hardwoods from the Caribbean hardwoods uh, are going to have to be cut down. I think uh, one of the trees was known as by the enslaved as the break axe tree. Just the sheer labor of clearing this, this forest must have been miserable. But in the process, uh, 
you've got with both logwood, which can be used as a dye wood, uh, and with mahogany that can be used as uh, it's water resistant. It has oil in it, which means uh, it doesn't rot so fast. Again, like the cedar from um, Bermuda. So these are both good shipbuilding woods. Uh, and these woods therefore get a premium as exports. And I think the third strand I wanted to, to look at this is for the secondary timber, uh, the secondary products is that they are what you can grow on the land that isn't so suitable for sugar. And if you look at the broader sugar economy, where Vereen Shepherd's remarkable work looking at uh, cattle raising and, and the pe cattle pens, whereby the cattle pens produced the oxen that then turned the, 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 the wheels for the sugar mills and uh, hauled those amazing wagons loaded with sugar, which must have been absolutely miserable to get through muddy roads. And so you needed oxen to tow these infernal wagons uh, down towards the ports. Uh, or Bacquadiers and, and, and jetties, where the ships could pick this heavy stuff up. But if you look at the rest of the economy, there's sort of areas that the land isn't good enough for sugar. And that's where you start getting people trying to go coffee in particular, uh, but attempts at things like cotton as well. Uh, in some ways, cotton doesn't do so well for profits, uh, but you see it coming back in the Bahamas, um, when the Bahamas don't work for sugar. You can see when sugar collapses in the 19th century that um, Montserrat goes over towards uh, cotton in the late 19th century. So these are, are ones that fit around the edge of the sugar economy. All right, does that answer your question or have I gone off at too many tangents? That's great, thanks Prof. Um, for my next question, what sort of labor practices were there on these estates? And did they very much before and after emancipation? Again, yes. I think that the labor practices are important. We've, we've got a great emphasis when we look at the labor on the sugar estate. And what's come up with the demographic uh, work is uh, basically the sugar estates were killing spaces. You look at the massive numbers of unfree Africans dragged in to um, the West Indies and the absolutely terrible uh, birth rates and figures. You don't get um, a positive birth rate in the Caribbean uh, for um, the ex-slaves until post-emancipation. Uh, uh, so in this period of negative birth rates and fairly high turnover on the sugar estates. What seems striking is that on the pens, and I think that would also include things like the coffee estates, and there's the National Library of Jamaica has a, a manuscript notebook. The handwriting is not very good, but it's uh, the letter book of a Liverpool-based silversmith who inherited a share in a ginger plantation on the north side of Jamaica. And he's, he's desperately trying to find out how does it work. And I was struck by somebody giving criticism and telling him he was doing things wrong because there wasn't much turnover on his estate. And what I think we might find striking about these secondary crops is they don't have the same death rates. They're not the same death warrant as the sugar estates were. And as a, again, if you look, I don't know how many of you have looked at Erna Bodba's fiction. Uh, she writes, she's a, a Jamaican novelist, but uh, her PhD was in history. And she also worked as a sociologist. And she's been doing work on the estate where she was brought up, a uh, former coffee estate up in St. Mary, Woodside. And there she's been able to find the genealogies of a fair number of the enslaved families on the estate. Uh, they're brought over in the aftermath of the American War for Independence, and they're then settled on a coffee estate in, in St. Mary, in rural St. Mary in Jamaica. And it looks as if a fair number oh, of the families, families have managed to survive. This seems a very different experience than you get on the sugar estates. 
And there may be a degree that the secondary crops may have been places with a a different demographic lifespan and also possibly a different potential for the carryover of traditions uh, from Africa or from the cohorts of the initial settlers rather than the other places that change over rather faster. But I'd love to be wrong in that. But I think we ought to recognize the different demographic experiences of life uh, growing some of the secondary crops or on those pens where there's the cattle, where there's a nearer to um, families and survival rather earlier in the system than there is on the sugar states. And so if we look at it, what does it mean for the people who are doing the work is it may mean a greater chance of having grandchildren or of having issue, uh, an issue who live uh, beyond 10 minutes after birth. Um, the more, so, oh, continue, Prof. No, that's, that was that point. Ah, okay. Um, so the marginal crops of the sugar era were on the margins of sugar-based economies. So from the 1840s, these economies were in trouble and island leadership sought for alternative crops that could supplement or supersede sugar. How far was this search continuing a process of searching for alternative export crops to cultivate in the West Indies? Uh, on one level, I think almost directly, though again, uh, there is the exception, which is Belize. Belize is exceptional in so many ways, but one of the ways is that it's not so directly based on sugar. And therefore, the Belize, uh, they continue with the mahogany crop. Again, there's a, a wonderful book, uh, All Well Here at Home, published by Kubola uh, in Belize, uh, that's the accounts of. Uh, an overseer on one particular estate of what does it mean. But there you have the different experience of the log cutters going out into the bush looking for these trees and hunting for them and then spending ages cutting them down, towing them to the river and then getting them off the river and, 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 and aboard. And there we've got one dynamic that starts off on the edge of the sugar estates when they do this in Jamaica, for example. Again, you begin to get logging crews from about the mid um, seventeen, uh, yes, the mid seventeen hundreds. But what you've got post emancipation is, or at least within a genera- uh, within a decade of emancipation, is the collapse of the sugar duties that had helped keep the domestic market in Britain getting sugar. And it's been argued that during the industrial revolution in Britain the diet of sort of how how on earth were they fed? And one answer is that uh, Britain had been able to import uh, sugar and then use more of the fruits and vegetables uh, that were coming in, uh, in terms of jams and pies and other, all those other things that give you terrible British dentistry. And the degree that sugar had provided the calories that helped uh, allow the industrial, the initial European industrial takeoff into uh, industrialization. But once you move into the late 19th century or mid to late 19th century, uh, the British islands, and to a degree, I think the French and Dutch as well, begin to lose the, the fiscal protection that had propped up sugar and kept sugar profitable into the early 19th century. And when you're losing the profits of sugar, then what on earth are you going to grow instead? And in part, you get the abandonment of marginal estates. And it looks striking that a fair number of estates and areas uh, in Jamaica, one might look at um, Southern Sinan, where new roads have been built in the 1820s, but by the 1860s, the land again is dropping back into peasant farming. And there you get a shift and in part, desperate attempts to find alternative crops. And on the other hand, where the the local assemblies, which are still dominated by the planters, are tempted to prop up sugar, but where you've got other efforts to grow new things instead, can you grow silk? And there are attempts to grow silk in Jamaica, there are attempts to to grow silk in in Montserrat. Um, And the difficulty is, is that these crops, again, are difficult to grow. One of the benefits of sugar 
as the even a bunch of fairly ignorant Europeans arriving and using brute force are able to make sugar glow unless you hit it with a hurricane or something. When you try and grow indigo, if you get indigo wrong, you've got compost and no crop at all. If you really muck up with your sugar, then when you, unless it leaks out of badly made barrels, or there was one occasion where somebody used poison wood to make the barrels and nothing could be done with what was put in them. But otherwise, even badly refined sugar, once it gets to England, is going to be re-refined and you'll get something for it. If you get if you get your attempts to go silk wrong, you've just got a pile of dead silkworms and maybe some bushes growing mulberries that you don't know what to do anything with. So some of the difficulties is the alternative crops get more difficult, but you can see uh, certainly the efforts to grow cotton in uh, the late 19th century Caribbean, some of the Eastern Caribbean islands, uh, the attempts to grow, bring in coconut, uh, to do coconut oil and the rest. And I think in some ways what you need to see is rather than that sugar was natural, which is what the sugar lobby in London is going to lobby, which uh, what the fatter planters and absentees from getting their profits off sugar are going to say, you need to prop up sugar to the government. If you're actually out in the individual islands or you're trying not to fall asleep over the dinner table conversation at government house, there the discussion may well be, can we go something else? And that's where you can see the botanical gardens, uh, both in St. Vincent and in Jamaica, as uh, desperately trying to find new crops that can be grown. Their attempts to go tea in Jamaica, the carry on from the 1860s through to the 1880s. And there are various other types of plants. Can we bring in this? Can we bring in that? And uh, there's an effort in the uh, 1730s. Can you grow, uh, oh, it's uh, the cacti on which the, the beetles that allow you to have a wonderful red dye. Um, I'm blanking on the title of the, of, of the dye. Uh, and the, these efforts to get new crops continue right through Jamaican and West Indian history. I was thinking of this in particular in terms of Montserrat, where they go, where they develop a niche crop in the late 19th century with limes, uh, and they're growing the limes for lime juice, uh, the main brand of lime juice on sale in England. And then they're hit by a succession of beetles through the 1930s, and are desperately looking for something else. In the short term, they go to cotton. Uh, and then in the 1950s, the British government pulls the plug on subsidies for cotton growing. And they try, oh, we will have a cannery. We will grow tomatoes and produce tin tomatoes. And they try that for two years and it fails. And then in Montserrat, they make a different joke. They go towards villas. And so the land that had been used for sugar, for limes, for cotton, and then maybe those tomatoes, is instead sold off to elite purchasers. And you then get money growing uh, uh, from the building work and employment, setting up the building. And then you get work produced by this uh, in uh, gardening and cooking and catering to the prosperous foreigners who've bought these villas. And one might see in Montserrat in particular, how far has the villa been the succession crop to the sugarcane fields? Uh, I'm not sure how far for the other islands, where again, the coastal plain is getting superseded by, by, by hotels. If this is another type of crop, where again, you're getting a local product, uh, hospitality, and using it to get international uh, capital. It's, it's slightly different, it, the dynamics are different, but it, the use of the land, uh, in Montserrat at least, uh, there's been some arguments about continuity. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Professor Robertson, for coming on Zoom with us today to do this talk. I um, really appreciate it. And we just want to tell everyone 
please um, log, uh, well, subscribe and follow us on our social media platforms, the Institute of Jamaica, National Museum Jamaica, the Department of History and Archaeology. Um, just please stay safe and stay tuned for our next episode. And thanks again, Prof. It's a pleasure. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.